And uh, it's an honor to share the, um, uh, the podium with uh, Professor Pinto. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about a very interesting disease, an unusual disease, not necessarily an infrequent disease, but an unusual disease and a fascinating disease and a curable disease and a treatable disease. And I think that's why it's very important for everyone to know about it because you don't want to miss it. So we're going to talk about going from pulmonary embolism to chronic, thromb to chronic thromboembolic disease. These are my conflicts. Shalom, uh, Yehudi Montreal, McGill University. And I'm, I want to say it here because I'm very proud because we recently fought off an extremely vicious uh, BDS campaign at McGill and the principal of our university issued an unequivocal rejection of BDS uh, at McGill. So, Tov Shasina, what's that? So, when you see an image like this, it's hard to forget it afterwards, okay? And this is chronic thromboembolic disease, and we're going to talk a little bit about how it develops and um, what we can do about it. We know that the great, great, great majority of patients with pulmonary embolism are treated with anticoagulants and have a resolution without any hemodynamic compromise. But a certain percentage, and we don't know exactly what percentage that is, go on to chronic thromboembolic disease. And we think what's happening is that there are a variety of genetic intrinsic variables, prothrombotic tendencies, and also recurrent thromboembolic events, possibly in these people, that lead to CTEF. And a lot of it goes on quite silently. There are also, critically, small vessel changes in vessels that aren't necessarily blocked up by the clots. In other words, the small vessels are presumably carrying the flow and, and because of that become injured and develop a process within them that's like PAH, pulmonary arterial hypertension. I'm going to talk about that because this is really where we're targeting much of our pharmacologic therapy. This slide is not to read except to tell you that there have been numerous studies trying to figure out what percentage of people with pulmonary emboli actually develop chronic thromboembolic disease. And uh, the numbers vary between 9% and sometimes as low as uh, half a percent in the population. We know certainly that there are lower risk populations. There was a large study in Canada that should be published soon called ELOPE, looking at low risk uh, uh, groups with uh, pulmonary embolism, and they have a very low incidence. So we really don't know what percent of people and, uh, get it and, what, and, and who to follow after pulmonary embolism to look for the risk of developing chronic thromboembolic disease. But if we do calculations, and these are from the United States, the number of survivors of, of pulmonary embolism are about 200,000 a year. If we look at the risk and say it's somewhere between, two, uh, between uh, you know, 1 percent and 4 percent, there should be somewhere between 2,000 and 8,000 cases of chronic thromboembolic disease per year. And yet, um, while these numbers aren't up to date, uh, there are more cases being done now in the United States. Um, the number of thromboendarterectomies, which is the surgery for chronic thromboembolic disease, is quite low. And this is something we're seeing in Canada too, and so I think we're still missing a lot of chronic thromboembolic disease. And a lot of it is presenting to emergency rooms with recurrent dyspnea, and people are misdiagnosing it as acute pulmonary embolism sometimes. So we can discuss why that may happen after. So we're dealing with really a very small subset. If this is everyone with pulmonary embolism, um, some people uh, have reported symptoms of reduced functional status after. Some people we can find persistent thrombi. Some people, if we do detailed testing, have measurable reductions in cardiopulmonary function. And then you end up with CTEF, which is basically the whole spectrum of everything. And when we look at sort of history, most of the people don't know they've had a pulmonary embolism. Only 50% have a history of DVT on average. Um, more will have a history of pulmonary embolism, but still 30 or 40% of people will tell you, I've never had a history of anything, okay? At the time they come in with severely plugged up. And if you look at the coagulopathies, actually the risk is very low in terms of incidence. And we know that some factors do contribute. Um, uh, having a shunt or an infected pacemaker is a huge risk. Splenectomy, certainly recurrent thromboembolism when it's known, interestingly, and malignancy. Another um, uh, series showed that uh, being obese was a significant risk factor, presumably, I guess, for deep vein thrombosis. Thrombophilia, 
uh, COPD, and then you know, inf general inflammation, uh, exercise limitation, et cetera. So we see a lot of people like this, and yet not a lot of people end up with chronic thromboembolic disease. So we really, again, don't know what the particular risk factors are for one person to get it and one person not to get it. But what we do know is that if they've had the acute PE, most of them have thrombus resolution with time. However, you know, some get acute right heart failure and then get persistent, even if they, if they don't die of the acute pulmonary embolus, get persistent elevation of pulmonary vascular resistance. Others, presumably, the thrombi persist, and eventually you get functional limitations. And then we also postulate that there may be a final hit <coughs> resulting in the pulmonary arteriopathy, and they go to chronic thromboembolic disease. And these are pictures from Irene Lang in Vienna, and this is not vessels that are plugged by clot. These are the small vessels that have developed an occlusive reaction to having to, presumably to having to carry the high flow um, from the other vessels being blocked, okay? And they develop a pulmonary arterial hypertension-like response. Kenneth Moser in San Diego described this years ago, but these are really more up-to-date pictures. Well, to get back to this, okay, this is really, if you look at it, a physical obstruction of all the pulmonary arteries. Here's the right lung, here's the left lung, okay? So what can we do about, for it? And in fact, the treatment of choice for this is surgical. And this is a sample of what comes out at a very good quality thromboendarterectomy. The, this tissue is no longer thrombus. It's, cr it's chronic organized fibrous tissue. And if you do a good job and pull it all out, uh, you can cure them. So, what, what's the schema for, for uh, considering chronic thromboembolic disease? Our acronym right now is SCAR, okay? Because we view what I just showed you as scar tissue. So first of all, you have to suspect it. So if you have someone with pulmonary hypertension, you have to look for chronic thromboembolic disease. And I've seen it in people with left heart disease, with lung disease, with atrial septal defects, with HIV, with scleroderma. Uh, it can come in in anyone, okay? anyone even with other causes for pH, for pulmonary hypertension, you can still, if you look, find this, and you don't want to miss it. So suspect it. And the screening test of choice is, oops, sorry, how do I go back? The, the screening test of choice is not the CT pulmonary angiogram. It's not the test that's used for acute pulmonary embolism. It's the standard non-sexy ventilation perfusion scan, what we call a VQ scan. And if your VQ scan is normal or low probability, forget chronic thromboembolic disease. That's why it's so good a test. It's simple, it's easy, it's accurate, and its negative predictive value is perfect. So if it's normal or low probability in your evaluation of someone with pulmonary hypertension, you've ruled it out. And really, these two should follow on each other as you're looking for other causes, but don't forget chronic thromboembolic disease. You want to confirm it. Of course, anyone with pulmonary hypertension to confirm the disease needs a heart cath. The CT pulmonary angiogram will help guide the surgeon, but it doesn't make the diagnosis. This VQ really is the test that tells you, oh, I've got to worry about chronic thromboembolic disease. And then finally, you assess the severity risk. How bad are the hemodynamics? What are the comorbidities? And then, of course, it's a surgical disease, principally, so you need a good surgical team. And these are the current ERS-ESC guidelines that were just published. Um, and you can see that when you suspect CTEF, the test to do is a VQ scan, not a CT pulmonary angiogram, okay? And the ra our, my radiology colleagues, even in my institution, will miss chronic thromboembolic disease. It looks very different. Especially, you know, if you're in an institution that's gonna see three cases a year, they're not gonna call it properly. You do the VQ scan. I can't tell you the number of referrals I get for pulmonary hypertension where I'm told, oh, we did the CT pulmonary angiogram, there's no chronic thromboembolic disease. They come into us, we do the VQ, the VQ is positive. So, so do a VQ, please, okay? And then, once you've diagnosed it, they have to be referred to a specialized center. This is a very specialized disease and you want a specialized CTEF center. And what you're looking for really once the patients come in, assuming they have it, is, is the clot proximal or is it distal? Because if it's proximal, it's surgically resectable. If it's distal, it's not resectable. And um, the, most of the morbidities and mortalities relate to an inability to properly clean out the lungs and reduce the pulmonary vascular resistance. So how do we treat CTEF? 
And why is it so important to find? It's curable if you can do a, pulmonary, a good pulmonary thromboendarterectomy for these people. And the pulmonary thromboendarterectomy is a, a, a fascinating surgery. If we have time after, we can talk about it. But I do want to point out that there were pioneers in this, Ken Moser in San Diego, and I'm sure this name Brunwald means something to you. This is uh, uh, Eugene Brunwald's wife, Nina, who was an excellent cardiac surgeon and really performed some of the early thromboendarterectomies. Perhaps not as well as with the current techniques, and, and, but, but the idea was there to get the clot out. And we now know that you can categorize how well you get the clot out and where the clots are. And um, the type 1 and type 2 usually give you ex excellent hemodynamic results. The type 3 and 4 less so. The type 3, if you can get a very good clean out, yes. Type 4 generally results in a very poor, a very unsatisfactory hemodynamic outcome. So what are some of the complications? Well, bleeding, certainly reperfusion, edema, persistent pulmonary hypertension if you don't get a good clean out or if they have the microvascular disease, persistent right ventricular failure, and any of the other comorbidities we know associated with cardiac surgery. Nonetheless, the mortality in good centers is extremely low, and I don't think San Diego's had a mortality in their last several hundred thromboendarterectomies. So it's a procedure that when practiced well is curative. And assuming you give them anticoagulation after and they don't re-embolize, they should be cured for life. So that's why you don't want to miss it. It's so remarkable. And certainly look at the survival, and this is already from a few years ago, compared to sort of no therapy or what we called medical therapy at the time. Thromboendarterectomy is the treatment of choice for this disease. Again, if your center has more experience, fewer of the cases are judged non-operable. And if you look at why cases are judged on opera, clot and accessibility, well, again, with experience, that's becoming less and less of an issue. Age should not be a problem. Comorbidity should not be a problem. Um, and the pH severity, again, doesn't make you inoperable, but certainly increases the risk of operation. But if you look, after a year, the improvement in functional class is remarkable, and the improvement in, in any index of quality of life um, and, and activity indices is also remarkable. You can really cure the person with this. We have people who are biking 75 kilometers a day after the surgery. So always consider the patient for thromboendarterectomy. You need an experienced surgical team, and they should always decide on operability. In our center, we do the surgeries. If our surgeon is uncomfortable, I send the films to San Diego. And if San Diego says they're non-operable, then I believe them. Okay, so remember pulmonary thromboendarterectomy. But what happens if you can't do this and they're non-operable? Then we, we're moving on to targeted pulmonary, uh, target medical therapy. But before that, I want to talk about another emerging technique, which is called balloon pul pulmonary angioplasty, which was originally pioneered in Boston, but has really been pushed forward by, this is the, the study from Boston quite a few years ago in 2001, but it's really being pushed forward by groups in Japan and now uh, uh, entering into Europe and North America. And if you do optical uh, coherence, um, uh, OCT tomography, you can find these webs in the vessels and the organized clot, and um, you, people do angioplasties on them, okay? However, it's extremely arduous. It, it involves about 30 hours of cath lab time per patient in a series of sessions. There's a risk of rupturing the artery with pulmonary hemorrhage, so you do only a few segments at a time. Nonetheless, for people where they're a little more distal and can't be reached, um, not everyone, of course, this may be an emerging technique, and we're looking forward to, to seeing more results with it. But I want to talk to you about now about medical therapy because we've had a revolution in medical therapy for, for chronic thromboembolic disease. Numerous of the pulmonary arterial hypertension medications have been tried in chronic thromboembolic disease. And there have been really only two randomized clinical trials, one with Bozentan and one with, with um, uh, Rhea Sigwat. And I'm going to talk to you about both of them today. Again, generally these are people um, certainly with the Bozentan study, there were people who were inoperable. With the Rio Siguat study, there were people who were inoperable who had residual pulmonary hypertension after surgery. The, ben the Bozentan study was called Benefit. It was a double-blind placebo-controlled study, quite a few patients. They had co-primary endpoints, had a significant reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance, but they could not show an improvement in, in functional capacity. Uh, they had a decrease in anti-proBNP. -pro the study is a negative study. 
Okay, maybe if they had done it again, maybe if they did uh, a longer study, I don't know. The study is a negative study. So when you look at that list of agents, until the arrival of Rio Ciguat, there is no proven effective agent for medical therapy of chronic thromboembolic disease. And now I want to take two minutes and talk to you about a novel class of medications. And I'm amongst friends here in the cardiology community. Okay, I'm a cardiologist too. I believe these agents in various various ones of them, are going to have a dramatic impact on cardiovascular disease. And they're just emerging, and interestingly, they've been tested in pulmonary hypertension first before some of the other cardiovascular problems. But you should know about them because they're going to have increasing impact and penetration into the, into the problems we all treat. And they're called guanolate cyclase stimulators. And the theory is as follows. When you have a healthy blood vessel with a healthy endothelium, you make a lot of nitric oxide. There was a Nobel Prize awarded for that. And nitric oxide works through an enzyme called soluble guanolate cyclase to generate a lot of this molecule called cyclic GMP, which is the second messenger. And it's a general rule in every blood vessel in our body that if you have a lot of cyclic GMP, the vessel's healthy and stays healthy. And that's been demonstrated uh, almost, uh, if you look at atherosclerosis, diabetes, hypertension, uh, neurologic diseases, I, uh, kidney disease, I can go on and on and on. They're all nitric oxide deficient states and therefore, so, and, and therefore cyclic GMP deficient states. Now it turns out that in pulmonary hypertension, it's also a severe NO deficient state. So there's much less cyclic GMP than normal. So what do we do right now? We use phosphodiesterase inhibitors to block the destruction of cyclic GMP by phosphodiesterase. But if you don't have a lot of cyclic GMP to conserve, uh, you don't have much more with a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Well, what if you could generate cyclic GMP either independent of nitric oxide, which is remarkable, so you don't need NO, or if you have some NO, it works even better and suddenly you're back to generating huge amounts of cyclic GMP. And that's why I think this class of agents is going to be so important for a variety of cardiovascular diseases. And the first agent that's been tested is something called Rio Ciguat. In Canada, at least the brand name is Adempis, and, and it's been approved. And um, it, it works by generating all the cyclic GMP. So you can't think of it as another phosphodiesterase inhibitor. It works on the same pathway, but it works completely differently and actually offers the hope of more effectiveness than a, than a phosphodiesterase inhibitor for a variety of diseases. And I'll show you that in some of my patients. So Rio Ciguat has been tested in chronic thromboembolic disease. Now don't take the message you shouldn't operate. If at all possible, operate. But there are people who really are inoperable. There are people who've had the surgery and either had an incomplete clean out or had a lot of that pulmonary vascular disease in the other vessels that have persistent pulmonary hypertension or recurrent pulmonary hypertension after, chronic after the surgery. Those are the people that were tested in this study. And the study achieved its primary endpoint, the study's called the CHESS study, it achieved its primary endpoint very effectively in terms of six minute walk distance but in a 16-week trial, it also had dramatic effects on hemodynamics, NT-proBNP, functional class. It didn't have an effect on time to clinical worsening, but there's not a lot of cl uh, clinical worsening in chronic thromboembolic disease in a four-month period. And, and nonetheless, there was a trend. It affected dyspnea and it dramatically improved quality of life. And what's nice is the effect is sustained. And I can show you a curve now to two or three years. I have patients already on it five or six years who are doing dramatically well and remain stable. This um, was the placebo group, and the pl even the placebo group catches up. And you can see in the, later, in, in the longer term curves that it catches up even more. This is one of my patients with chronic thromboembolic disease. She came from another country to Canada. She had been given sildenafil because they had nothing else to give her. So she arrives on sildenafil and was actually really not doing well. And I transitioned her from sildenafil to, to adempis, to reosiguet. And you can see that, first of all, her Borg dyspnea scale declined dramatically, and her six-minute walk improved very significantly. Now you can say to me, okay, this is open label, uh, it's subjective, et cetera, et cetera. But this is not subjective. This was her anti-proBNP level and had been like that for a while, okay? And when I switched her, it fell dramatically 
and it stayed down and it has con continued to stay down. So Rio Siguat is not another phosphodiesterase inhibitor. It's a very, very different agent. So what are the current recommendations? Pulmonary endarterectomy is the gold standard. Don't forget that. You need a chronic thromboembolic team with an experienced surgeon to assess whether a patient is operable. And we all ask for second opinions. This is not an ego thing. If we feel it's not operable in our center, before saying to the patient you're not operable, I send the films to the best center in the world to find out if they're operable. Okay? And these are the ESCRS guidelines. What's for medical therapy? Rio Siguat. And look, it's a class one recommendation for patients who've been having persistent recurrent chronic thromboembolic disease after surgical treatment or inoperable CTEF, but by an experienced CTEF surgeon, okay, and an experienced CTEF team. And I'm going to stop there and take questions. Tadaraba.